Bueno, entonces vamos a iniciar con esta sesión. Bienvenidos a todos, muchísimas gracias por la paciencia. Llevamos tiempo con, con, uh, con COVID-19, pero todavía hay muchas lecciones uh, por aprender, como ustedes, como ustedes pueden ver. Si necesitan traducción al inglés, por favor vayan a donde dice interpretación al globo y ahí verán, uh, marquen por favor inglés para escuchar el canal en inglés. Please, if you need, uh, if you need English translation, please go to the little globe and uh, you can see, you can mark uh, uh, English and hear the, the, uh, the English translation. Muchísimas gracias nuevamente por estar con nosotros el día de hoy. Eh, este es el primero de una serie de seis diálogos sobre la ética de la investigación durante la pandemia, desafíos y lecciones por aprender en América Latina y el Caribe. El título de esta primera sesión es Estrategias adoptadas para la revisión y la supervisión éticas de las investigaciones relacionadas con la COVID-19. Eh, es un gusto estar con ustedes uh, y antes de iniciar, antes de compartir, la, la, uh, de contarles quiénes nos van a acompañar en el diálogo del día de hoy, quiero contarles por qué es que desde la OPS hemos creído importante hacer este diálogo. Leave it important to, that we undertake this discussion. We think that the region has responded very well to the challenges of accelerating the ethics review process and doing it in an adequate manner during the course of the pandemic. Nevertheless, throughout this time, we've learned that the pandemic is not very much like a sprint, like a hundred yard sprint. It's more like a marathon a very hard, very arduous marathon. And throughout the course of this marathon, we're starting to realize that we have additional tasks or tasks that are more challenging than we thought in the beginning. So what am I talking about? I'm talking about ethics review and ethics oversight, which is in high demand nowadays. So within this very demanding context, we realize that Notwithstanding the fact that we had an excellent response at a regional level in the beginning, we have had to make certain adjustments over time. This is not a stationary scenario. It's a rather dynamic evolution. And as we move along, we've had to make adaptations and adjustments that could serve to benefit other countries and other committees that haven't yet adopted some of these adjustments. Many of our national authorities and committees have learned many lessons throughout the course of the pandemic, and we believe that sharing this knowledge with other colleagues and with other stakeholders in the entire region would be valuable so that they can then subsequently implement many of the lessons that we are learning. So we need to reproduce, or we don't need to reproduce the same process over and over again. We don't have to reinvent the wheel, but rather we can learn from other colleagues. So that's the first reason. The second reason is that we're already looking forward to the next emergency. And based on we've, what we've learned so far, we are thinking about what we can do better in the next pandemic. Now, if you recall, when we first started undertaking these efforts at PAHO, we started working on the ethics review and oversight processes, and we discussed how to undertake one of these procedures in a rapid way and in such a way that we can address the needs at the national level. And we, want, we were talking about this prior to the COVID pandemic. We started talking about this back in 2018, and I think that I think that this learning process was accelerated just in a sudden way. And it was part of what we had already been discussing, but we had to pick up the pace. And so we have many lessons that we've learned and 
while the information is still fresh in our minds, we should come together to see how we can address potential future pandemics using these lessons learned. And so that was the driving energy behind creating this dialogue. Learn from what we've done, what can we do better, and how can we share all of this information to address these issues in a more effective way in the future. We'd like for this session to be completely open. We don't want it to be just a session geared towards authorities or committees. First and foremost, we did this because the PAHO has a firm commitment towards a national, international ethics system at, at, in the entire region. All of this can only be placed or put into practice if we all come together. And it doesn't just involve authorities and the specialists. Secondly, we believe that it's important for us to open this dialogue to the entire region because we've come to realize that many times some committees or some national authorities go to a lot of trouble to respond to the challenges posed by the pandemic, but they don't necessarily involve all of the people in country, all of the ethics committees, all of the researchers, and therefore they're not all on the same page. And so this is a great opportunity for us to share all of the efforts that are being undertaken in the region. We have a series of six discussions that we are scheduling. We're trying to alternate between countries, topics, perspectives. And I'd like to begin by inviting you to, in the chat, and I'd like you to write to bioethics at paho.org and email us any suggestions that you may have for us to address in this series of discussions. And I'd like to thank you in advance for your questions. And I'd also like to ask you to submit your questions through the Q&A page and any additional comments or presentations that you may have uh, you can share through the chat. I think that's all I had for you as an introduction and I'd like to introduce our panelists for today. We have the very good fortune of being joined by, let's see if everybody's here. Let's see, we have Gustavo Stefano from Brazil. He is representing the National Committee of Research Ethics in Brazil, CONEP. We also have Santiago Torales from the Research Division of the Ministry of Health in Argentina. We are also joined by our Argentina Yang from the National Committee on Bioethics and Research from Panama. And we are also joined by Raul Timana, the General Office of Research and Technology Transfer of the National Institute of Health in Peru. I'd like to invite all of our colleagues who are joining us today, all of our panelists, to first and foremost, activate your cameras during the session. And I'd like for us to have a discussion and I'd like it to be as dynamic and, and exciting as possible. I'd like to thank you in advance for your flexibility and for your support in this rather novel series of discussions that we're going to undertake. I'd like to highlight that one of the reasons why we selected these institutions, national authorities, we decided to invite these national authorities because these were authorities that we had important discussions uh, 
regarding these very important issues prior to the pandemic. So I think they really benefited from that opportunity to start thinking about these issues in advance of the current crisis. And so I wanted to just thank them beforehand for joining us for this session. And as I stated previously, we will be posing a series of questions to our panelists in a rather rapid way. So I'd like to ask our panelists to activate your cameras and keep them open during the session. And as we ask you to answer a question or give a comment, then you can unmute your microphone. And we'd like to ask all the other participants in the session to submit your questions through the Q&A room because these will be questions that will be posed to the panelists. I'd like to begin this dialogue with a first question directed at all four panelists. And this question is as follows. Well, first of, all, first of all, we know that our region includes very different ways of organizing ourselves in a structural way when we address issues related to ethics. And as part of that discussion that I alluded to previously, we had the opportunity to discuss a number of strategies. And given that context, I'd like to ask what measures or actions were adopted to accelerate the ethics review and oversight processes during the pandemic within your own institutions and within your own ministry that you represent? And I'd also like to ask why you selected those particular strategies. So I'd like to ask Gustavo Estefano from CONEF to answer the question first. Thank you very much, Gustavo. Thanks to all of you. Can you hear me? Very good. Well, thank you for the invitation to this discussion. I'm going to set my timer at five minutes because I know that we need to stay on time. We conducted uh, an evaluation at our organization when the pandemic first started we tried to identify how our system would work. This is a system that's made up of more than 850 staff members that work for different research divisions and health divisions. And these 850 people are coordinated by a national commission on ethics related to research. And just to give you an idea, almost 98% of all of those issues are analyzed and approved or rejected based on the intervention of this very broad system. So we try to address the various challenges and what it means to conduct these uh, assessments of the ethical framework. Only a very small fraction of the work that we do is undertaken more than one time. We've done extensive research on stem cells, embryos, and other subject areas. So you can imagine what the challenges are because um, Back around January 30th of this year, it was clear that we were in the midst of a national health crisis. And so we started to consider this from a very broad standpoint. So one of the first actions that we undertook at the organizational level, and this was the day after the crisis was announced, we tried to focus our analysis uh, 
along a certain channels. So the decision was made to attach a, a specific special application primarily to harmonize all of these analysis. These analysis are not focused or centered on a single institution. And so we established a, a timeline of seven days to be able to undertake these uh, processes. And in some cases, uh, we would extend this out two more days or three more days, especially when we were talking about medications. And so we established um, permanent uh, technical committees in various areas in the nation. We started working on a pandemic uh, full time. And we have now four groups that focused entirely on the pandemic. We've seen a wonderful and immediate response by all our people in Brazil. We've seen an avalanche in research projects. We had to also address the regulatory issues at the national level to be able to undertake these procedures. In many instances, we saw systems paralyzed, especially during the months of April and, and March. And so many issues that were very sensitive were reviewed a second time by satellite committees and other ad hoc committees. So this is the approach that we've uh, attached to all of this. And we underwent a huge learning curve, especially at the beginning stages of the pandemic. And then we moved uh, the work to the regional committees that I mentioned previously. Another important action that we undertook was to review this learning, this information, but we tried to continuously communicate with this enormous body of people, more than 800 people that were dispersed uh, all over the country. And one of the key goals that we had is to engage in continuous communication with all of the key stakeholders. And we shared all the information as it was coming out. We started a, a newsletter that was published for the first time in March. And these are bulletins or, or newsletters that are published twice a week. And for many of our people, this has been the key publication for the scientific community and for the public at large. So in terms of the more broad-based strategies that we adopted, those were the primary ones. Thank you very much, Gustavo. It's very informative, especially as you relate to the adjustments made as you were moving forward. Argentina, and I don't mean the country, I am referring to our colleague Argentina Ying from the Panamanian National Committee on Bioethics and Research. Argentina, can you tell us what sort of actions you undertook to be able to address some of these challenges posed by the pandemic and what were the underlying reasons? Well, thank you. I'd be happy to just to provide a little bit more context about the P Panama case. We have our National Committee on Bioethics in research, and we also have additional ethics committees, three more. So at the beginning of the pandemic, we prioritized uh, the protocols related to stem cells and this was based on new legislation that was enacted in 2019. Thankfully, given the extensive communication that we had with Carla and Pajo prior to the declaration of the crisis or the national emergency in Panama, we had already approved the operational procedure 026, which was based on guideline number 20 that relates to the accelerated review process under scenarios of emergencies or disease outbreaks. So this allowed us to first and foremost assess the importance of the situation based on the actual contingency. So the committee was aware that part of the response to the contingency needed to include the research element. Subsequently, the health ministry 
approved a, a resolution that provided us legal support to be able to accelerate this process. Now, this did not merely focus on the ECOPS 2 situation, but rather any contingency. And we were even considering what could occur in the future. So the 026 procedure, which we approved, was geared towards uh, facing the challenge of accelerating the response and do so with a high degree of reliability without affecting the quality of the design or the scientific and social value of the research. And we were firmly committed to this high degree of rigor given the conditions of social and public vulnerability that we were facing at the time. So this resolution does in fact address all of these potential situations in a very broad way and it refers to certain timelines. We had 24 hours to provide oversight for the reviewers. We had another timeline to submit the report, uh, 48 hours for researchers to respond to any questions or concerns. There was a moment, as Carla mentioned in the beginning, that this seems very much like a hundred yard sprint, but this began to turn into a longer, more complex situation. And so there was some time where we saw a great deal of saturation, especially in the, the uh, technical secretariat. That was the organization that was receiving all of this. They had to work before, during, and after all of this work was being submitted. They had to consolidate all of the opinions of the reviewers, send them out to the researchers, and get that response back from the researchers. So we started to seek other partners and, and garner other institutional support. Clearly, we contacted the most experienced committees to try and lighten the load a bit. I could certainly provide some more details of other actions that we undertook, but that's the overview of how we address this particular situation. Thank you very much, Argentina. Raul, how did you deal with this issue in Peru, my own country? It's a pleasure to hear from you and to see you, Carla, after so long. Uh, greetings to everyone and thank you for the invitation to take part in this discussion. In Peru, we responded very actively and we issued a document. I would invite all of these colleagues that are joining us today to review the document. I think it's very simple and it could be very informative to many countries. In Peru, just to provide some context and provide you an overview, we have 174 accredited reviewers. Uh, the INN is uh, the coordinating body for this uh, re research ethics review and oversight committee. Uh, many institutions have their own RECs, research ethics uh, committees, and it is the, the main uh, committee that accredits these uh, subcommittees. So in conjunction with some work that we did with PAHO, we created a national committee that serves as the central point to address uh, any ethics issues related to research undertaken with humans. Let's remember that Peru was one of the countries that very quickly imposed the quarantine lockdown. I mean, it wasn't very long before we declared the lockdown and we imposed the quarantine procedures. So this certainly allowed for the committee to address some of these issues that from the outset, and we also had a supreme decree that was signed by the Minister of Health and by the nation's president, establishing the guidelines for uh, research ethics and the review and oversight thereof as it applied to the COVID-19 pandemic. So we started to conduct a great deal of 
activity related to the review and oversight process. All of these uh, were then subsequently presented to the, the Central Committee, but they were expedited in the most effective and safest way for the benefit of the, our Peruvian citizens. So when we talk about this standardized process, it was important that we understand as quickly as possible, but not only quickly, we needed to also understand as much as possible all of the issues related to the safety of our citizens in Peru. And so we needed to ensure that we could maximize and optimize our processes without sacrificing any quality. Thank you very much, Raul. Now I'd like to move to Santiago from the Argentina perspective as a federal country. How was it that you addressed these strategies to be able to conduct timely and rapid review and oversight procedures for research ethics. Well, thank you, Carla, for the invitation to participate in this discussion where we can all learn a little bit more about how we can continue to move forward with the organization of this key topic that exists in, in such a complex environment, not just in that related to health matters, but also organizational matters. Like my colleagues, uh, I just wanted to give you an overview of the um, characteristics of our national health system in Argentina. First and foremost, I'd like to recognize something that was already mentioned previously that has to do with the fact that Argentina for a number of years, since 2018, has been working on these adaptations to accelerate these procedures that have to do with research bioethics and we engaged in a very large effort with the provincial governments in this regard because as part of this entire reorganization for the activity portfolio of our ministry of health i started working with the research division in may of this year when we were already in the midst of the pandemic and to my great satisfaction and to give you an idea of what you can achieve when you schedule things in a timely way and when you work effectively with your team members. I was able to hit the ground running when I took on my position and I was able to count on our national committee in Argentina and the leadership of Ana Palmero, who headed up the research division at the National Health Ministry and by March, April, we already had a ministerial solution that set out the guidelines for the accelerated undertaking of these review procedures. And so this was part of an effort that had begun prior to the pandemic. We were able to transfer all of these guidelines to our bioethics committees located throughout the nation in our different provinces. We have a very particular organization and set of guidelines for the organizations and so are these committees are in charge of it undertaking the bioethics reviews in those territories. So this is work that had been undertaken previously, but we just needed to update the process. And I think that all of the committees located in all the provinces were able to adopt these accelerated guidelines and in fact, they had already foreseen them and suggested some improvements to the assessment tools and did so online. Over time, we realized that rather than traveling somewhere where everybody would meet in a single place uh, once per year, uh, we started realizing that it was more effective to meet more regularly and more frequently through platforms such as this. This was also very, effective in decision making. We also were able to bring in external experts to save time and to improve our timelines. And so we started addressing this from a variety of perspectives that allowed us to improve these research ethics review processes in a much more effective way. Something else related to the health arena 
when we talk about clinics and other facilities, we have different compartments here in Argentina. We have a science and technology division that had certain priorities for their research work. Part of it included uh, the COVID-19 virus. We also had another structure in another part of the country, but there was a decision made by our Ministry of Health to unify all of these organizations that operated in a parallel fashion. And all of the organizations were working on the COVID-19 pandemic under the single umbrella. And that's why we created the research observatory, which is made up of all of these committees that register and record research projects in all the provinces. And clearly this is public information that we provide through our website at the ministry. So any citizen can consult and access this information. The pandemic came when we had not yet presented some protocols. And so we have to generate previous assessments within the different territories. Thank you so much, Santiago. I believe the first reflection after hearing you is that I am amazed at the enormous volume of work that you have conducted in the countries of the region, especially these last four countries. And we have to understand that this is not, these are not peace times. We have never dreamed a year ago that we would have this conversation and we would be able to accomplish even half of what we have accomplished. I would like to ask Gustavo, thinking of the experience of Brazil, do you think that all the actions taken by CONEP have been effective? Have you accelerated the work? Have you had a thorough review? Where are you located on specific topics? What is your feeling after this experience? Well, we were really hit by the pandemic. We were really hit by the energetic response of the scientific community, and we had to accelerate our own work. We, of course, have to have a very rigorous vision of these ethics problems. At the beginning, much to our surprise, here at the national level, we conducted clinical studies and all of these uh, were initiated in some cases by, by pharmaceutical industry. And then of course, we had to think of all the budgetary shortcuts that we have had. But then we were avid to have, eager to have answers. We would say that there are many pragmatic clinicians in their approach, and also we have the pharmaceutical industry on the other side. But we saw that we always have to think in the first place of participants. Many times, uh, people did not show a mature attitude when it concerns scientific questions. Many times we had to go and develop a system to have an audience so that we could have a rapid response to the pandemic and then draft protocols appropriate for the conditions. And we were not at the beginning able to visualize all of this. And just to give you an idea, we have had more than 750 programs about 30 of those 30 percent of those are experimental studies and other are observational studies in general today we have many resources we have our bulletins uh, we have a thousand participants in many studies 
and we of course uh, have gone through a very rigorous process of research throughout brazil uh, we have been working hardly very hard here in conep so the balance is positive very positive thank you so much gustavo for this reflection you touched upon some thorny issues here and the difficulties that research faces on the scientific area and this is of course something we deeply feel we have to promote and we're eager to promote but many times we don't see things to go as we wish i don't know if argentina santiago or raul would like to complement these comments for us the experience has been a win-win experience in normal times uh, we would have research that would last uh, months right now we have studies that are conducted in 13 days and we do all of this research with thousands and millions of people so comparatively our work is uh, is not as uh, as uh, comprehensive as in other countries we have a smaller scale but about in 20 percent of our cases we had research that produced results in seven days we have few data but then there were many researchers that were not able to answer questions on time and i would say 10 percent that was 10 percent in two months but we did have situations in which delays were caused in some uh, the submission of some research data but they didn't have valid information so we convened the meeting through senate and we had to make some adjustments we felt that we had a lot to win here we drafted research protocol the protocols that really didn't take long to produce uh, given the complexity of the studies many times we would have 11 emails with seven attachments and then we would have to just put our feet on the accelerator but we were encouraged by the fact that we were never uh, in a need to reduce our quorum we only have one person who works full-time and that's the secretary uh, there but all of us were assigned specific tasks we were able to devote our time to those tasks but really we were working um, separately uh, from this part-time person uh, from this full-time person so i think we relied a lot on the researchers that have a lot of experience thank you so much santiago raul any other comments to complement what you have done yes yes of course just some clarification here i think uh, we only have right now 24 studies uh, going on we would like to have more but on the other hand yes we have been working with our colleagues of argentina and brazil and we have to actually work as a central unit regarding all of these committees that have been established at different institutions we would like to have centralized committees because this will speed up all the processes we have seen 
that the concept of normalcy, quote unquote, um, entailed four to five times for ethical review. Many times we had an average of bastante, bastante, eh, reducido este tiempo y then eso. we have shortened the time that it has taken us uh, to work on this. So speed is, has been a positive uh, development. So we have to reflect upon this, what we have learned. At the beginning, in Peru, during compulsory quarantine, we kept on working. And through the indications of the government, we agreed to uh, go and continue assistance activities because health workers are on the first line of work. So they are working very hard and their time is reduced. So it is very difficult to have sustainability here. The sustainability of this type of strategy is something that we should cons be of concern, cons we should be concerned about. So the, the secretariat support and the administrative support is not enough because all other resources are there and all of them are heroes. They are doing their research from one corner and the other. And on many occasions, they have been able to find not only technological solutions, but also health solutions. So I think the Essex Review Committee have responded in a very, very important and sensitive way. But then this leads us to reflection about our weaknesses up to when will, be able, will we be able to maintain this load of work. It is an intense load of work. And then times are hanging upon our heads. So it will be very difficult for us to sustain this level of activity. So what can we do to maintain this level? This has been recognized and sustainability is something that we should be concerned about because we perhaps will not be able to continue to show this level of sustainability. You have really hit the nail on the head. Santiago, anything that you wish to add? Yes, I was thinking about Raul's comments. The situation and the feeling here in Argentina is very similar to what Raúl has said about research, how we contribute as experts, and then the ethic review committees have been the ones that have been working hard. They are on the first line of work. They are fighting against this pandemic. So this is something that generates sustainability uh, in the long term, but the sustainability will be diminishing in the long term. And this was discussed this with the committees. And the message is that just like uh, the health workers who are on the first line of work, facing all kinds of risk and trying to solve people's problems, the people affected by the pandemic, now we have to go with the same enthusiasm, the same degree of dedication, we have to work around the clock so that this research can be evaluated and the population can benefit from these accelerated studies. And then we can just deliver this to the population. So this is a work that requires a high level of enthusiasm but we have to find a mechanism that is still yet to be defined. One of the things that we accelerated for impact here in Argentina uh, is the fact that uh, we have to consider this is a very, very large country with lots of auton autonomous 
uh, authorities uh, to decide on this process. So we have to conduct a review with the National Ethical Review Committees to ask how did you do in this pandemic? What are your thoughts about this? But then we have, yes, we have had differences between jurisdictions. We have had difference in the response of the public and private sectors. And then we have to study that to see what we can improve. But yes, the processes have been accelerated, but they have had many variables and these variables will generate different results uh, in the political area, in the other areas. Even we have to study how did we manage inside the organizations all of these problems with the pandemic. And we may have to analyze things that are different from what he had proposed to research. For instance, uh, chlorine dioxide and other products. So our committees have been working hard on many issues, but then these are other research projects. But I think this has been an accelerated um, project. I value, highly value this project uh, and the way it has developed. Thank you, Santiago. I'd like to take this opportunity to uh, talk about the line you have mentioned many times in difficult situations, in challenging situations such as this pandemic, begins to see things that before were invisible. We start looking at things, at ways uh, of doing work that perhaps could be improved beyond the pandemic limits. Before we were on automatic pilot and we could not think that we could do all of this in an accelerated manner. So what is your reflection on all of these obstacles that we have had and all the things that perhaps we could improve beyond the pandemic? Well, first of all, what we're doing right now is a clear example that we cannot we don't have to travel all the time. Especially my personal experience working in two or three consultant activities at the same time and with the Ministry of Health and being here in one place. And the possibility of having all of these tools available so that we can work on different fields, science in particular, uh, requires adaptation and resilience to the vis a -vis the situation. We have had um, everybody's cooperation to coordinate uh, as a nation, and then inside the provinces, each provincial committee uh, has been strengthening all the evaluations and all the cameras. <coughs> we were considering having some surveys to see what is the situation of the Ethics Committee in the entire country. We will be presenting several results for the entire country to see how they adapted to the pandemic situation in our public health magazine, uh, we will be publishing the results of all of this uh, survey. And we are very pleased to be able to share this information. Sure, we have had obstacles in many places, but in general, the most important thing is to be able to exchange information, to give alerts on time. And as we say here in Argentina, we should not just begin to invent the, the wheel again. We will all be operated under the same standards uh, in a very homogeneous way, sharing experiences. Uh, rapidly so that we can advance. Thank you so much, Santiago. Gustavo, Argentina, Raul, would you like to make any other comments? 
de alguna manera visibles en la pandemia. Somehow we have had some visible aspects during the pandemic, something that we were not aware of before the pandemic. Just like my colleague from Argentina, I believe that during the migration to the virtual space, this is something we have overcome. In the past, we never thought of doing this. Apparently, being in the virtual space, we can have quorum because this gives people more flexibility. So that is a problem that we have solved and overcome. And the other thing is to make a call to researcher when we have doubts about the process. Uy, perdí. Será que soy yo? Perdí Argentina. Per I lost the broadcast from Argentina. Okay. A ver, mientras que la recuperamos. While we recover the Argentina connection. Yes, what I'd like to share with you is something very brief. With all the obstacles that mentioned by Raul and Santiago, in Brazil, we have a certain degree of automation in our processes because we start with a special platform that is very favorable And then this allowed us to overcome some mechanical issues. Um, we were able to apply all of these to ethical reviews. And then the centralized analysis of all of this gave us new tools. It allowed us to have an internal evaluation at all the clinical trials and all the initiatives that were formulated. Many of these experiences uh, sometimes led to an alert. And so that is why centralization is essential. We have found some obstacles. Yes, they were challenging. And they were brought about by the pandemic. But we are working on ethical reviews. So we have to have alternative ways of evaluating the situations. And this led to a very intense period of reflection, something that we could apply to our work because it was an emergency. It was a public health emergency and it was in real life. Thank you so much. Argentina, we lost the connection with you. Gustavo. Gustavo, could you please speak closer to the microphone? Argentina, we lost your connection. Yes, we had a method to contact the researchers so that we could just clear up all our doubts. And then we established formal communication with them. And then we, of course, uh, had a lot of mutual supporting meetings and then calls to experts. Uh, many times we saw that there was a lack of uh, ge genetics uh, specialists. So this is a modality that before uh, was absent. So somehow or other in this area, we have gained a lot. Raul, any other uh, final comments on this? Yes, of course. I was listening to my colleagues uh, and their reflections. As Carla, 
I said the idea is to compare what we're doing now as opposed to what we're doing before. And the strategy that you mentioned and the context are important. The context is something on which the Ethics Committee has devoted a lot of time. There are certain activities, they are not essential activities, but they come together with this. So this is a work of a very exclusive nature. The members of the ethic committee should be asking what type of challenges will we have in the future? We have to recognize the new processes and everything we're facing in the case of Peru. It is important to face that. The members of the committee have been dedicated to this work exclusively. So for us in the future, we will have an obstacle in the future because everybody will go back to their normal occupations. And then the obstacle that you said beyond the pandemic, what are the main things beyond the pandemic? And that is the exclusive nature of the work we're doing right now, as opposed to what we did before. Before we thought, well, yes, I do have some important activities to do and complete. But then this is a work that is, has been conceived at the national and centralized level. So, is the change, the change is essential and it is an obstacle because nobody is going to go back to work after the pandemic as intensively as we have worked right now. But the Essex Committee is motivated, has incentives to keep on working this way. This of course, Yes, we will ha have many challenges, but we have really t take a 330 degree turn in the way we approach this work. We are working as facilitators and when we work as facilitators, this changes the whole concept. Thank you so much. I believe the fact that we are all in the same boat and going in the same direction uh, shows obviously that uh, this communication is uh, more fluid. We are less enclosed in our specific physical spaces. So now we have a higher degree of permeability. We're more open to conduct research. What are we thinking about the future? Full-time as ethics committee member? We have to continue to think on this because we are not in agreement as to the expectations and the demands and the reality that we are facing. So I believe that these are all topics that up to now, in our region we have faced. I'd like to take a moment to ask you a question about the landscape in Peru. The ad hoc committee that was created for the ethics review and oversight of COVID-19 protocols only applied to clinical trials, correct? I'm wondering what have you done with other types of research that don't involve clinical trials, but are still nonetheless related to COVID? Well, the, in fact, that's one of the types of research that generates the most amount of volume. The budget typically is lower. The majority of researchers have more clear objectives. And so there are more numerous and we've seen a growing volume of research in, of that type. We've had some issues related to the regulation involved in creating this, these committees. But at the ministerial level, what we have done is create some 
documents related to general COVID research. And we've also, at the committee level, developed uh, in conjunction with PAHO some other instruments that will serve as guidelines to ensure the rights of citizens uh, as part of these uh, research projects. And we didn't just address the decentralization in the region, but we also had to re decentralize the registration process because we're not just talking about registering experimental and clinical projects, but other research projects related to COVID-19. This was in other research projects not related to COVID an option, but now we're asking where the research is being undertaken, what type of research it is, and we're trying to map where these COVID-19 research projects are located, and we're using this registration mechanism to be able to do it more effectively. Thank you very much, Raul. There is a comment that in Peru, there was a specific committee created to address the COVID-19 pandemic. It's interesting to see that different layers of all of these strategies that you're mentioning, we're not talking about a very simple structure. And that's why we wanted to talk about these perspectives that your authorities have. Whether you're a committee or not, the oversight for all of the ethics research committees or the research ethics committees have a lot on their plate. We have many strategies, but somebody has to provide oversight for this. And in many of your countries, this falls to the institutions. Argentina, you were talking a moment ago that in Panama, the volume of research increased dramatically. And that fact made the committee's task much more difficult. I wonder what actions have you considered to respond to that? Can you speak to that particular point? It appears Argentina got disconnected. I don't see her. I think she may have gotten disconnected. While we wait for her to reconnect, Let me go ahead and ask a question to Santiago. We're going to go from our colleague Argentina to our colleague in Argentina, Santiago. My question for you is regarding the strategies adopted in Argentina. Have you been able to avoid any duplication of efforts in these multicentric studies or are the RECs at the institutional level conducting the reviews uh, of the same protocols? I mean, what strategies have you employed to manage the issue of many committees engaged in the same effort? Well, the response really should be to what degree we've been able to avoid this practice. I think that avoiding it in its entirety is impossible. Many things just happen autonomously beyond any agreements that we may have in place. And even then, when we talk about jurisdictions, we see that each committee can have their own particular way of doing things and how they engage in assessing projects. But we do have some good examples in some provinces. And just to talk about the most useful and most graph graphic examples, regarding how to address efficient use of time and space for the evaluation of multicentric studies. In one case, for example, the review committee, every time they received a multicentric study, we'd conduct a roundtable session on the Zoom platform to get on the same page as to which committees would be participating or how they would participate with their respective research institutions and what roles they would have. And so we had round tables for comments and con consensus, both on the part of researchers and sponsors to be able to conduct assessments 
on the protocols to achieve some measure of consensus, what was consigned for approval or what needed to be modified and what was being rejected. So that was one way of doing it, just carrying out meetings where we would just have an open discussion involving all of the possible committees that could be involved in the study. We'd bring in the researchers and the sponsors as well as the committee members. On the other hand, what we did was redistribute the task. If we have a multi-centric study, then what we did was, okay, we're gonna assign this part of the work to one committee, this other work to the other committee, and then subsequently we'll meet for the, everybody to submit a report. So it wasn't necessary for us to meet three times, but rather we would meet once, we would assign roles and tasks, set a, a common goal, and we would always, of course, be based on jurisdictions that have a long history in the development of their own committees. And we also had to follow standard operations to be able to achieve consensus across the board when we talk about the assessment results. Thank you, Santiago. I think it's a good idea to also think about these unusual circumstances. And I don't know if the response is whether we duplicate efforts or not. Clearly, we conduct joint reviews. We have different committees engaged in a joint effort to assess or evaluate or conduct these reviews. And I think it's an interesting idea. And it's also something that we could think about in the post-pandemic phase to recreate the, our MO for multi-centric studies. Well, while we wait for Argentina, I wanted to comment that as part of this work that I do with research in the health ministry, I also work with the National Council on Health Technologies, and we discussed this very point. How can we assess the new technologies that are being designed or that are being manufactured for COVID or for whatever other thing? And we start to see a tremendous waste of time when multiple actors just take off and engage in research. And, and when we compare that to a better, more coordinated approach where people and committees can address a portion of the problem and then work in a parallel fashion, that's a much more effective way of doing things and it's less wasteful. Well, I think that that's a very good point that merits more consideration. I'm wondering if when we talk about other jurisdictions or other committees, do they conduct a deliberate review uh, that requires a certain type of analysis? I think that we need to consider that we have to maybe approach things in a different way. We need to be able to share what we know. We need to be able to see how people or how committees do things in their own particular space. Many times it, this, could be ri this could give rise to other ideas that could be useful for everyone. Somebody could say, you know, I don't know what you did here, but we do this and it's just a tip, right? I had a, another question for Gustavo regarding, before I move on to the next questions for the panelists, I'd like to pose a science fiction question and Gustavo, I'd like to direct it to you. If you could go back in time, Gustavo, if you could go back in time, what would you have done differently? What would you have proposed be done differently to ensure that these ethics review procedures are done in accordance with the timelines and needs posed by the pandemic? Well, I think that we would all agree on this. I think that centralization was a key. I think this was the shared experience that my colleagues have referred to, and I think it allowed us the opportunity to achieve greater harmony in our efforts to meet our timelines. And it also allowed us sufficient time savings to transfer all of this information to other committees. I don't think that centralizing the effort was a, of a small importance. Uh, clearly, 
one of the things that uh, we considered in our experience that is that we may not have opted for a centralization, but we could never have imagined that the pandemic would have evolved the way it has. But I think that this centralization decision allowed us to at least uh, consider the ethics component in a much more effective way. If we had done so earlier in the process, we would have had more energy and a better idea of how we were going to move forward if we address this earlier. Thank you very much. I am in complete agreement with that insight. Now we have Argentina back. Argentina, we lost you, but I believe we had asked you what actions do you believe you could undertake from the standpoint of your committee to manage the increase in the volume of research related to COVID, which as you stated for a time became a bottleneck for all of you? Yes, for us, experience dictated that we needed to adjust ourselves to the timelines. We've already made some modifications to the operational procedure that was not based on hours, but rather on work days. For me personally, I think that we could create a hybrid scheme because if we ever face a similar situation, perhaps the first few months could be dedicated to these specific time terms. And then after three to four months, we could consider a review towards, or even a revision towards a, an accelerated version based on work days. Now, what we've seen is whether or not we could classify or categorize these studies to see if they're academic, which we then lead to us directing them towards academic institutions, or if it's not related to interventions or pharmacology related, then we could also direct those studies to those key protagonists. But the idea would be to properly and effectively direct the traffic and direct these studies to the right people. Another thing that we've been talking about for some time, even prior to the pandemic, addresses uh, or relates to the need of creating a continuous monitoring effort. So we need to open up the National Committee to be able to address the oversight uh, considerations uh, at every level. Thank you, Argentina, for mentioning that. And I'd like to tell all of you that the next uh, PAHO document related to orientation that we expect to be issuing next week relates specifically to supervision procedures for studies that are underway. There are a number of things that are already done at present, but we've seen a condensation or a compression in the timelines that has obliged us to change the way we do things. So in our guidelines or orientation document, we're trying to support researchers and research ethics committees to uh, analyze their processes related to the review and the oversight activities and create questions that will help people to properly create or engage in oversight for a study in a much more effective and timely way. So I'd like to now open it up for our participants and perhaps get some questions. Uh, we have Saraka Acedo that works with Raul at the National Institute of Health and she also works for the PAHO's Bioethics Division and Ana Palmeiro who joins us from the operational office at the Ministry of Health in uh, Argentina. 
Sarah and Anna have played a key role in the development of these orientation sessions for the organization within the pandemic context. And to make this a little bit more dynamic and interactive, Sara and Carla will moderate this portion of the dialogue. So Sara and Anna, I yield the floor to you. Hello, good afternoon. Thank you, Carla. Thank you to everyone for joining us. We're going to move on now to the questions that we've gotten from our participants through the Q&A room. Ana, could you get closer to your microphone? It would be very helpful. So our colleague from San Luis, Argentina, from was a member of the province committee, and she mentions that an ad hoc committee with uh, medical experts and external advisors was created and she asks what was the experience during this time in terms of the relationship between researchers has there been a greater closeness among the researchers compared to the type of relationship that they had prior to the pandemic Cualquiera. Can anybody answer? Yes. Anybody who wants to chime in? Well, in our experience in Panama, we've had a great deal more communication with researchers because, as I stated previously, many times we have to reach out to them when we're discussing the assessment of their protocols at the committee level. We try to reach out to try and clarify some of the concerns that we have at the committee level. And this helps them prepare prior to getting the more formal documentation. I think that at the national level, the committee has had greater visibility, greater presence, not only among researchers, but among everybody, all the community at large. Yes, in Brazil, that's exactly what happened. We used to have a type of ritual of bringing in the researchers of putting researchers in contact with our organization. And as a result of the pandemic, all of this basically tripled. So it was driven both by them as well as by our organization, but it's a really interesting way of operating. And now given the availability of these virtual technologies, then I think that we've been able to do it in a much more effective and more frequent way. From my standpoint, I agree with uh, the comments made by Argentina and Gustavo. I think that as long as we see a good faith effort by all of the stakeholders, uh, not only the committee team members, but the researchers as well, if we have everybody just being civil and behaving appropriately and cordially towards each other, then I think that this leads to a much better relationship, but we've seen a great improvement in the relationships. Clearly, we also need to assign the roles and responsibilities in order, in order to ensure that decision making, decision making is done in the appropriate way. In the case of Peru, we normally used to have some communication with researchers, but they were rare. And as I understand it, with these new committees, the contact with researchers has been much more fluid, much more frequent, which has been the key item with regards to these new procedures that we've adopted in this new version of the review and oversight process for these studies. Well, thank you very much. How are you? Thank you for your participation in today's session. I have a question here that is directed to Peru, Brazil, and Panama, who have uh, national committees. And the question reads as follows. What relationship exists between national committees and these institutional committees that are working on COVID research issues? Is there 
an environment where you share experiences? Do you provide recommendations to each other? Are you in contact with each other? What type of relationship, if any, do you have? Well, I'll be brief. We created a series of reports that we share with ethics committees, and this is part of a very active communications network that is geared towards updating the entire network, the entire system to ensure that we are all adapting to the newest uh, issues that are arising. There's clearly some baseline work that needs to be done because in Brazil, the local committees work with the national committee. They don't necessarily work with each other. It used to be much more fragmented and so the National Committee decided to try to establish some parameters as the regulatory agency that provides oversight for all of these committees. And so they have jurisdiction over the executing agencies or committees and now what we're seeing is a much more fluid more effective and more frequent communication and i think that at the end of the day this exchange of information will be very interesting and more effective because it will give us the ability to garner more knowledge about the local experiences which can be extremely diverse depending on the location Yes, what I can say is that in Panama, the National Committee is the organization that accredits the Institutional Committee. So we have a type of network, and in that sense, we have garnered support from the committees that have more experience, as I mentioned a moment ago, to try and address some protocols that are less complex or for which they had a particular expertise. As part of this, we've expanded our efforts. We even had a meeting with all 13 accredited committees so that those that did not have as much experience could then avail themselves of the technical secretaries and they could engage in an internship at the national committee level. And this was helpful for them to garner more experience and learn more about the national committee so we do have a fluid communication with the institutional committees so we do provide support amongst them and these are all based on the protocols that we all have to adhere to but those committees that have slightly less experience we've offered uh, internships for their technical secretaries at the national committee so that they can learn more but at the same time once they go through that internship process, they could provide support for other committees. Well, in the case of Peru, the centralization of the review process was solely under the jurisdiction of the National Committee, especially with regard to COVID-19 research projects. We already had a, a mandate of exclusivity, but what's important regarding the contributions made by institutional committees is that the members of this new committee are a part or have been a part of the accredited institutional committees. So we've accessed a very valuable talent pool that was already experienced at the institutional ethics committee level and they had a number of years of experience. And so this has been very important for the connecting of all of these institutional committees with the centralized committee. Moving on to another question. There's an interesting question here because at the outset of the pandemic, we thought that all of the research related to COVID was priority and every other kind of research took, uh, went to uh, 
a, a lower level of priority. And there were a number of issues related with the public safety. So the question is, is it necessary to continue with this rapid review process or should we set aside different criteria or priorities depending on the type of research that is involved? What is it that we need to do with the rest of the portfolio of research that's out there? And has this been discussed at, in your respective countries? Or what would you think needs to be prioritized at this stage of the pandemic? In the particular case of Argentina, we have had this process of requisition whereby some of our authorities use uh, foreign laboratories uh, to conduct research in our country or some of these foreign actors want to engage in research in our country and so this goes to the question, if we're trying to accelerate these review procedures, why can't we accelerate the processes for other clinical studies and other clinical research? This is, I think, a common sense issue from my standpoint. We all understand the degree of stress that we have in trying to move forward with these processes and the truth is engaging at all times in the effort to accelerate all things, I don't think is a prudent way to proceed. We need to focus on priorities, not only on what needs to be researched or what need, needs to be delved into, but also we need to be able to respond to all of the urgent needs, all of the urgent requests that we have for many of these research projects. It would be impossible to be able to address the sufficient number within the space that we have to try and look at these. I think that we do need to set aside some guidelines, but they need to be based on a prioritization. And we also need to include diagnostic and therapeutic mechanisms that are part of the pandemic effort. We need to consider the circumstances for each one of our respective countries and the other research projects would need to be schemed or screened, that is, based on a prioritization. We can't just uh, submit the first one that we get to the review process, though we have seen that this new mode of work doesn't require the presentation for us to addr address the issue in advance. So I'm thinking that not everything has to be accelerated, but not everything has to be bogged down and then lead to a good piece of research uh, take longer than necessary. Argentina? Yes, I just wanted to talk about what we've done. In our national committee, we've been working on this, and I'm sorry, my internet is giving me trouble. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, it's sending me a message that internet is unstable. I am right now connected through my cell phone. What I wanted to ask is, yes, this was the prioritization of research. Yes, up to now, the institutional committees have kept their normal rhythm of work, concentrating on other topics, but they, every month, should give us a report of the information received. And then they keep the, their own rhythm, but then what we want to do is to make sure that we have not only accelerated responses, but timely responses. Uh, if there's a delay, what is the cause of the delay? What can we improve to increase speed in the production of this data? So this is just a, a complement to what we're doing. 
May I speak? Yes, of course. Yes, go ahead. In our case, we had non-COVID protocols that were kept at the same rhythm as usual. Uh, for obvious reasons, of course, uh, less time was devoted to them. But then, of course, you know, there is some dilution of the uh, work and the assignments. But we have to have time to understand. We have to have time to create to make sure that we understand the peripheral system, so to speak. Uh, we centralize every one of the COVID protocols. In April, we had a review and we examined most of the national guidelines for all of these uh, COVID protocols. We, of course, uh, saw whether they use uh, biological human materials or not. In April, uh, we conducted uh, mental health assay assessments to see if we could recognize some special traits. Then later on, we widened the scope and then we began with clinical trials. For instance, people who would be in charge of a central evaluation, uh, we worked at that level. And so in July, we are uh, publishing, have published uh, some protocols on human sciences and health sciences together. So centralization allowed us a different type of communication. So we were able to review this work and give the proper orientation to the ethics committee. Uh, also to have a prioritization system for this project. This is what we're doing at the central level. Thank you so much, Gustavo. Sara, next question. This is related to the development of the pandemic. As time goes by, the pandemic is changing and the needs, of course, change. The response to the pandemic changes. So we have to adapt them. The question is, if you have faced burned out or the number of uh, people in charge of the review, and if you have thought of the possibility of establishing midway strategies, creating some health committees for specific aspects, so to give the members of the committee some time to breathe. And then I don't know whether you have any changes on this or any measures on this in your own countries. Well, the burnout of members is the reason why we had to concentrate on uh, all the members of the international committee and this has been the motor so that we think again uh, as to what we would do different in times of pandemic or in other times. So we have to review that part. All of this has been submitted to the National Ethics Review Committee so that we have new strategies. Undoubtedly, The key point is the curve, the learning curve that includes burnout. And then that is reflected physically. Most of us, the entire time, were working remotely, long hours. Now we are working in some face-to-face -face 
technical and practical aspects. So I believe being tired, the fact that we were tired was the motor that kept this work uh, going and we have thought about the new strategies. Yes. In the case of Peru, we are living through burnout of the committee members, ethical committee members, because they are the main workers on COVID-19. I would say that this was to be expected in view of the seriousness of the situation and what Gustavo mentioned that uh, we're not thinking only of the stress and the number of clinical trials that has to be conducted, uh, but also the study of the monthly indices and so forth. But the fact of being confined to a space of working at home, the fact that the pandemic in, in itself is a serious thing. The, also the fact that you are on the first line of fight against the pandemic, the fact that you go home and you have to observe all the protocols so that you don't uh, infect your family. So all of this contributes to burnout. So there are many factors. And then of course the committee now has a very heavy workload. And it's not surprising that they are burned out. Many of us, uh, we're not only talking about the ethics committee, we're talking about in general, all the staff of uh, in the public health sector and private health sector, authorities, and everybody. So we have to think about, think anew, and have incentives to see how we can have new strategies for the ethics committee and to concentrate on the reviews and the oversight. In this case, in Peru, We have assigned, for instance, at some point, only clinical trials. Observational studies, of course, have study. But it, this is something that we have done in all these past few months. So, if you're thinking about strategies, we have to really do this with a very fine-tuned mechanism. You have health, public health aspects, you have legal aspects, you have to have incentives. It's important. I would like to share our experience. We have already changed our modus operandi but then we have some legal aspects to be solved and we are hoping that the ministry will amend the resolution about uh, work working conditions and uh, of course we had uh, to run against time and get as much resistance as possible and think of mental health we have not had any complaints but there were times when we had meetings that lasted eight minutes and why eight, eight, eight hours and why eight hours? Because of the number of protocols we had to evaluate. So we had to assign to refer studies when we received different reports from different committees. So we are hoping that the ministry will instruct us as to the changes in terms of time that is in agreement with what lies ahead. 
Thank you, Argentina. Next one. You were talking about this, the strategies for multicentral centric studies. And one of the questions asked the possibility uh, for implementing the reviews inter countries, especially uh, chemicals and others. We share some protocols with other countries. So maybe we could just plan for review strategies among countries in collaboration among countries. Towards the end, we would be looking at the possibility of establishing a permanent forum among the countries of the region. In my opinion, yes, that is possible. We would have to condition this to our capability for agreement under the parameters under which we can conduct evaluations. But then, of course, Many definitions could be framed within the local culture, the local points of view, the local health system, on some internal regulations in the countries regarding legislation and research. But the way to have a review uh, is, yes, of course, go at the international level, but we could standardize a process, but I believe the question would not only be targeted to us, but I think from PAHO, Carla perhaps uh, could tell us about this work, this international work. Oh, thank you. You put me on the spot. There are topics that we have considered at PAHO, considered a lot taking into consideration the great diversity of uh, uh, the country in Brazil. We have 850 uh, committees, a uh, very complex structure, and St. Lucia in the Caribbean, a very, very small country. Uh, so if you go to the uh, strategies document published by PAHO, we have included as one of the main strategies a committee that is not restricted to a national territory, thinking specifically in the needs of those countries in which the situation is more difficult, such as small countries. In Brazil, Argentina, Peru, Panama. If you already have burnout and all of these difficulties, because you have so many roles, Imagine in a very small country. So thinking of that, we proposed in a conversation that we have been holding for a long time, for instance, the English speaking Caribbean could have a committee for review that is adequate for all the English speaking Caribbean countries. In other areas of Latin America and the Caribbean, where we have had this conversation previously, it's in the Comisca countries, Central America and the Dominican Republic, because they already have a structure that would facilitate in the future uh, this type of work. So this has been uh, discussed in the forum of Comisca in many opportunities. And then we are considering the two scenarios, emergency and everyday life. So up to what point could the review of a regional or sub-regional committee or sub-regionally and regionally accredited committee could at what point could that committee review the situation in the countries that adhere to their uh, principles or that have a specific type of local situation we know that there are challenges uh, uh, to conduct research in indigenous populations, for instance, in Guatemala. And in Costa Rica, they all think this is science fiction, but in Guatemala, this is real. So we have, that's because of diversity. And that's an idea that, of course, uh, has a long road ahead, but this would be essential for what we are going to be facing in the future.
por, por Thank you, Carla, for all of your comments. Going to the next question, thinking of the reality and the magnitude of this uh, problem, we have a demand for the review of research program, and then, of course, this has to be implemented rapidly. So how about the changes in the procedures of evaluation and implementation? They are asking if the centralization of the review process would be an obstacle, and if we would have the alternative of strengthening the committees, uh, that would be better. I don't know whether you have any comments on this uh, topic. As Carla said at the beginning, this pandemic will leave many teach many aspects that we still have to learn, but also that we have already learned. It's a teaching experience, it's a learning experience. But we will have an essential role. And that, uh, knowing that we're going to be burned out and we have to work hard ahead, uh, that we have to have a very energetic and uh, drastic reform, we, yes, we could have strategies in the new uh, system, something that covers the peripheral area, so to speak. We would have to work with the people who take care of the patients, uh, with the scientists, with everybody. So the model of having a national agency for accreditation and for standards is a fantastic idea. We are working on that. We are making enormous efforts considering the size of the continent. And then, of course, the uh, area of influence of the Ethic Committee. But we have in mind the establishment of a national agency, having a group of scientists with lots of experience. That could be part of this stronger strategy. And then we could centralize this. Yeah, we have been thinking of centralization, and centralization would allow us not to have duplication of efforts. Uh, we would say, yes, we're doing this, but this is also being doing over there. Why are we going to duplicate efforts? Many times, an institution doesn't know what the other is doing. I think decentralized centralization would be the answer. And I'm sorry, may I? May I? I think this is a crucial topic. We have had a lot of things coming into our ethics committee. This is highly institutionalized. Yeah, we, these topics of decentralized centralization is very, very important. We have to analyze the context in which we have to give a different answer. So the context targets a different way, targets a way of doing things differently. And we have to guarantee the rights of the citizens. So the fundamental idea is to make optimal use of time. As Argentina mentioned, the essential idea is to know what is being duplicated here and there. Where do we target our research and our efforts? 
where is the direction of research? Where is the direction of health measures? What are the strategies for this specific pandemic? Where are they targeted? We are actually taking back what has already been asked. This is a process that should be followed in different types of diseases and different types of scenario. We have different contexts because I think this would allow for prioritization of relevant health problems. For instance, uh, let's talk about a, uh, an ethics review committee for tuberculosis. We could have this uh, committee to review all the guidelines for tuberculosis. So this, this, I'm just thinking out loud, but you know, this is just an idea, just to see that what we have learned before, we can apply to different diseases and institutions. This has, of course, advantages and disadvantages. So we would have to consider this. We would have challenges because of centralization and the ethical review. Thank you so much, Raul. Last questions. Some of the questions I uh, related to procedures, and then we will go to the next session that uh, deals specifically with these topics. The search for vaccines and treatments, of course, we're all interested in this at the global level, uh, but we have several political pressures. So. My question is, have you felt any political pressure and how have you managed that uh, fa facing the different authorities of the Ministry of Health? Could you please repeat the question? Yes, this is related to the different political pressures to accelerate the approval of different protocols in the search, actually the accelerated search to find a proper treatment. How have you managed this situation uh, if you have faced them? In the case of Argentina in particular, I am not naming this as a member of the ethic committee, but as a director of health services in the country within our directorate. We have a protocol in which the Ministry of Health could uh, sponsor and supervise and develop this uh, protocol. But this has to go through an evaluation. Uh, every time that we have conducted that evaluation, uh, we had to do it fast and it was a cause of anxiety, but we have always had the possibility of doing this under the technical expertise uh, that we had and not under political pressure. Uh, the political pressure would not be as such except for the speed in which this is required. But then we do know by references from different jurisdictions in our country that for specific cases, thinking about not only political situations, but also uh, social pressures as to whether we send this or that topic to the media, the committee has had enormous challenges to be able to evaluate things that had not been presented at the clinical level. So we had to have a certain position vis-a-vis, -vis, for instance, uh, uh, chlor chlorine dioxide and other things that we widely discussed in our countries. So the ethics committee, without having presented a research uh, protocol, we had to have a posture and express a posture. It was good practice to inform society about this. So that was the pressure to do the work. All of us have been pressured to do the work fast because uh, we were had the influence of external authorities. Yes, as I say, that uh, 
political pressure, the bioethic committee in Panama has not had any pressure. The closest thing that could have had would be a consultation at the beginning. And this didn't have anything to do with research, but the use of convalescent plasma. And then out of that study, uh, where we didn't feel any pressure, the ministry took uh, and made a decision about this, but we did not feel any pressure. Many researchers want these studies to be accelerated. But no. In our case in Brazil, I could say that we have a tremendous pressure from an information agency because the media from the beginning were eager to communicate the news and to publish the news. So undoubtedly, of course, you know, I'm not just throwing the first stone on the guilty, but I think in our case, we are walking through very flooded areas, so to speak. Any pressure should be exerted, yes, but not when it goes beyond individual rights. Many times, yes, we think about this, we are in between crossfires. We have to give priority to our work and to our opinions and expressions. But there are pressures, very atypical pressures from an atypical uh, situation created by the pandemic. And many times people lose sight of what is really important. And this is a project that involves human beings and we should not forget that. So everything could be discussed, but what is not under discussion is the rights of the population. Thank you so much. Thank you to all my colleagues. I believe this is a fantastic session. My sincere thanks from Pajo, not only for sharing this learning space, these questions, these challenges, but also for doing this in such a sincere and honest and frank way. This is the first of a series of dialogues. And as Ana and Sara said, we have not ignored your questions, but I think these are important questions and we're going to devote a session to this uh, question. Please uh, subscribe to our next session which will be next Tuesday, and we will be emphasizing the processes of the committees. Again, my sincere thanks. Thank you, thanks to the panelists. Thank you to the moderator, to, to the logistical support, and to the interpreters who are behind the scenes trying to convey these reflections to all the colleagues in the English-speaking Caribbean and other parts of the region. I would like to remind you of the final message, what we always say at PAHO. Why are we working? We are working this to serve as catalysts for ethical research, which improves the well-being of our populations. Thank you so much for your dedication, for your uh, work, and for the work of the authorities of the committee, the panelists, and everybody who is listening to us today. Thank you so much and have a nice afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Carla. Good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Yeah, Raul, Santiago. Yeah, greetings from Argentina. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.